So today I'm in Arco, Idaho, which is the first city to be lit by atomic power. And the reactor that supplied that power was EBR1, which I've previously done a video about before, and it's a partial meltdown. Cool place to check out. But today I'm going to go back over there and use the Radicode 103G and test it up against these nuclear jet engines, or atomic jet engines, however you want to call them, and see how high that reading goes and see what kind of isotopes I can detect using the 103G. And I'm actually going to be testing it against the Radicode 102 and the Radicode 103 and see how differently they respond to that environment. So let's get over there. So EBR1 sits on the Idaho National Labs property. And so they control this area and they also control the airspace. Like I can't even take off my drone here because it's restricted airspace, which is too bad. I would really like to fly around this place, you know, at least around EBR1 and those uh, jet engines. But where you can actually go on this property is very controlled. There are signs everywhere that say, don't go down this road. This is controlled by the Department of Energy or Idaho National Labs or something around uh, that wording, which is fine. It's okay. I mean, there's a whole lot of nothing out here, but it would be kind of nice to maybe explore a little bit more, but I'm sure there are things out here they just don't want people to run across, maybe from previous testing. I think they might be in the process of uh, cleaning these nuclear jet engines up because a lot of the bird's nests have been removed from here and they have this sky lift. There we go. <laughs> Something like that to probably get up here and to help kind of clean up some of this stuff. Because I imagine if uh, all the birds up there gets uh, pretty messy. So this is a lead-lined locomotive that was used to move these heat exchangers, <laughs> jet engines around because they're so massive and heavy. So this one would pull from the center track and then the jet engines had four different rails that they would ride on. It's a lot of, a lot of reactor to move around. <laughs> So this bit behind me is supposed to be the most radioactive point in all of these test reactors out here, or test engines, however you want to put it. Uh, at least that's what I've seen from the papers that talk about the decommissioning of these nuclear jet engines. And what I found interesting also is that when they first defueled these to try and contain some of that radiation to kind of kick it down, they actually filled the cooling cavity of these reactors with mercury in a way to to block the radiation because mercury is very dense not as dense as lead but it's pretty dense and they used that mercury to block the radiation and but there's no more mercury in here anymore they actually drained it out and now it's radioactive waste, unfortunately. So it's not only is it mercury, but it's also radioactive waste. <laughs> so right now I'm just kind of planning out like how, where I'm gonna go with this pole because I don't wanna be doing this for too long because I, I have a feeling that if someone that works for the Idaho National Lab sees what I'm doing, they'll be like, oh, hey, wait a second, you can't do that. I, well, it wasn't a sign saying I couldn't do it. and. I, maybe they'll be interested, but I, I kind of feel like they'll see someone like kind of like going around their rules and be a little upset. So we'll see. So I figured I'd just do like a basic test. And so I wanted to just put these all on the fence right next to this kind of like radiation field that's right here to see how the different detectors respond. And it looks like the 102 and the 103 are responding pretty much the same as far as like counts per minute. But the 103G is actually showing a about a thousand counts per minute higher 
radiation dose. And this might be because of the increased sensitivity of the new sensor that's inside of the 103G. And if you're asking, where did I get these snazzy cases? <laughs> Someone uh, from Instagram sent me these. I guess they 3D print them out. Also, the orange ones actually color change with heat. So if you grab it, it turns yellow. And they're made specifically for the Radicode detectors. And so I'll leave a link uh, to this guy's Etsy store in case you wanted to pick one up for your Radicode. Uh, so far, I mean, for this experiment, they're very handy. Like if you don't want to have your detector just bear onto a, a surface or something like that and not have it in the leg holster if you don't have one or something like that. But I'll post that guy's information in the description uh, if you want to go uh, pick one up. So I figure since I have these all mounted up on the fence right now that I'd actually go and do a clean gamma spectrum data accumulation between all of these devices and see how big of the difference there is. So this is the 102, the 103, and the 103G. Now the gamma spectrum data will probably be pretty similar between the 102 and the 103. The 103 does have more resolution, uh, but on the 103G I'm suspecting that'll be a lot better. So we'll see. I'm gonna let these run for about a half an hour and see what that data looks like. So I turned off the clickers to all of them except for the 103G. Now, the idea was to originally go and tape all of three of these onto this and put it right up against that reactor core. But because I don't really want anything to go too wrong, I'm just gonna use the 103G and see how it responds to this higher level of radiation. Because I'm curious to see what it says if I can get it like right up against that core. So it should have enough bite and shouldn't go anywhere, which is exactly what I want it to do. It wants to be nice and safe and secure and not get lost behind the fence. Just seeing if anyone's looking at me. None so far. This is giving me, looks like a hundred thousand counts. Let's do that one more time. So I wanna see what it looks like in counts per minute. I mean, nothing crazy. I'm getting around, looks like uh, you know, 60, 65,000 counts per minute, 65,000 counts per minute. Now, what does that come out to for dose? All right, so now this is switched over to microsieverts per hour. So we'll see what this looks like. One more time, and then I'll stop pushing my luck. So it's only giving me around 14, 15 microsieverts per hour. This actually isn't too bad. 17, 16 microsieverts per hour. That's almost, ah! It's almost on contact. All right. 
Well, I'm done with that experiment. <laughs> So here at the Gallatin Towers to test out the Radicode 103G. Now I came out here because this is a spot where I've previously identified nuclear fallout. That was fallout from uh, nuclear bomb testing over at the Nevada test site that drifted all the way from Nevada all the way up to Montana, Utah, all these places. But here at this one particular spot, I was actually able to identify cesium-137. That is a man-made isotope only occurs in fission reactions like in nuclear bombs or in um, nuclear power stations like in the core and so it's a fission byproduct it's completely man-made a synthetic isotope when i find it here it's a proof of radioactive fallout from those tests in nevada back in the 50s and the 60s i was going to use my usual spot that i go and i do these tests from but uh, people are climbing like right where I set up usually to, uh, to uh, find the cesium-137 because it's not, it's not really detectable. Well, I mean, it is kind of detectable everywhere, but you have to kind of know the places uh, to look for it. Like it needs to be like in the cracks of rocks and stuff like that. Uh, that's usually where this fallout has been hiding for the last 60, 70 years. So I'm, I'm actually, uh, getting a data collection at another spot to see if I can try and find that CZ-137. So far it's looking like it's coming up empty and so I'm just going to let this uh, continue uh, getting that gamma spectroscopy data back there behind me and then I'm going to go and move those detectors over to that spot where I know that CZ-137 is and see how well between the three of those detectors how well they pick up that very trace amount of that fission byproduct that's here in Montana, thousands of miles away from the Nevada test site. The other thing I've also noticed too is that the Radicode 103G is actually able to pick up on the potassium 40 in these rocks, which makes me think that these rocks actually have potassium or potash inside of them. Uh, potash is used as a fertilizer and for making gunpowder and all kinds of stuff. Uh, they also call it like saltpeter and stuff like that. What was interesting is I haven't seen potassium-40 come up in the gamma spectrum before. And so 103G is actually showing that it's actually much more sensitive to a wider range of gamma energies, which is pretty impressive. Now what makes the Radicode 103G different is its sensor. Its sensor is a GAGG. Now what does that mean? That means gadolinium aluminum gallium garnet. That's the type of scintillation crystal that is inside of the detector. And what happens is this gamma ray goes and hits the detector, hits the little crystal inside of there and a flash of light comes out. So this actually gives better resolution of that light, of the spectrum of that light, the energy level. And the other thing is too, is that it's more robust. It's a much tougher crystal in there and that's what makes it so cool. I actually think NASA has started using those type of uh, crystals in their detectors as well because they're just much tougher and they can take much more abuse and they have better gamma resolution. And so it's pretty cool that we as consumers get to have this device, we can just buy it, this, the same type of uh, kind of cutting edge technology that NASA is using to do radiation experiments with. So I'm going to let those collect information for a little while, maybe like 30 minutes or so. And then uh, hopefully I'll see a peak at the uh, 662 KEV peak, which would be for CZ-137. But right now, I think I'm gonna try and fly my drone around a little bit. So now I'm home from the Gallatin Towers and I was able to review some of that gamma spectral data. And it was interesting to see the difference between the Radicode 102, 103, and 103G. You can definitely see that there is a peak at potassium 40, whereas 
on the 103G's uh, spectral information, whereas with the Radicode 102 and 103 it is barely there, like almost almost on the edge of being undetectable. It, I mean, if you were looking for it and kind of thought maybe that those rocks had it, then you would probably find it. Uh, it's also the same thing with the cesium-137. The cesium-137 that's there at that location, the, the remnants of that nuclear testing from the fallout, is very slight, very minute. It is almost, almost undetectable, the same way as that potassium-40 is with the, other, uh, with the other gamma spectrums that were taken. But with like the gamma spectrums that were taken at a EBR-1 with those atomic jet engines, uh, you can see that the gamma spectrum from there is much more defined. Like you can see that it's obviously cesium-137. That's because of the greater increase in the radiation field there. You can actually get more of uh, more information from that area because the radiation is so much stronger. When you have a weak source of radiation, it is much harder to build a uh, gamma spectrum off of that information because you're dealing with such a lower amount of energies coming in from that particular isotope. That's the reason why you won't see like a, a huge peak like you do at those atomic jet engines. That's the, that's the difference when dealing with these type of different locations and uh, pulling data, but even though it's from the same isotope, uh, that's just something to think about. Like when you're trying to go out and get a gamma spectrum from a certain area or a certain item or something like that, you just have to take into account of, of the radiation that's coming out of this item and how it's being collected and interpreted by like a device like a radicode. So I've been using the Radicode 13G for the last month or so, and it performs just like all the other Radicodes do uh, with the app and all their stuff, the, the radiation tracking, everything like that. It's a tiny more uh, sensitive in certain situations. Like I noticed at uh, EBR1, like at those atomic jet engines, I noticed that this one was actually showing a little bit higher count rate than the Radicode 103 or 102. And then you also have better gamma resolution when you're doing gamma spectroscopy stuff and the sensor is more robust and that's you know kind of what you're paying for there and it's also new technology it's kind of the cutting edge of like what's coming out so if you'd like to pick up a radicode 13g i'll leave a link at the bottom of the screen right here or in this video's description you can pick one up through there or a radicode 103 or 102 and also i'll leave a link to these uh, bumpers these little protective cases for the radicode 103g 103 102. So I'd like to say thanks to Radico for sponsoring this video. And if you enjoyed this video, leave a like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. And I will see you in the next one. Take it easy. Man, that took way too many takes.